Welcome to Precure Live's nightly update on COVID-19 and where we're at in this rapidly changing world. I'm Professor Grant Schofield and if you know me, most of you will know me through my work in public health, I'm a professor of public health. I've, actually, it's interesting because I've always talked to people and said, I oh, know I do non-communicable disease because uh, we, really, we don't have any communicable diseases anymore to worry about. It's really how we live our life and diabetes and uh, obesity and, and cancer and these sorts of things that affect our quality and quantity of life. Uh, my, how the world changes. So I'm rapidly re-engaging in communicable disease and this uh, COVID-19 virus and the global pandemic that's changing our world and rapidly changing our world. Now, I would say now I'm taking a scientific view on where the science is at because what's happening, you'll see at the moment, is there a lot being published daily. And thank God for journals like The Lancet, uh, the BMJ, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, getting the latest stuff out really, really quickly from places like China and Singapore, uh, as well as other groups doing some pretty wicked modeling that's making a big difference. So I want to talk about that. Uh, heads up. So if we're talking public health, then we're talking about mortality and lethality and these sorts of things. So um, if you want a COVID-19 break and talking about those things is going to cause anxiety or annoy you, um, just jump off now, please, because I'm, I'm going to do that. So the first thing I want to talk about is the big report that really switched how big parts of the Western world responded to this because Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and their ways were not handling this well until they received a report from a group in Imperial College London, uh, the, the infectious disease modelling. So no one knows what's going to happen here, but one way to understand it is understand what has happened and use that data with a number of assumptions to try and understand what could happen and how those scenarios could play out. And that's exactly what this group did. And I want to talk about what they did because I think it's impressive um, interesting and really changes what you think about that. Uh, so the first thing I did is model what happened would happen if we did what we call a mitigation strategy. Now mitigation is what we do for seasonal flus. So we don't try and stop the peak, we try and mitigate the peak. And we have a number of tools at our disposal. We can vaccinate people against seasonal flus and it has some evidence of working. We can treat people with the flu with antivirals. In other words, they have the flu, we're not going to get rid of it, but we can give them medications that reduce the load of the virus and therefore improve their chances of doing well. Um, you, you'll know this mostly from the success we've had with something like HIV, where we're not curing people from HIV, but we're reducing the load to almost nothing. So they basically can just get on with their life. Uh, so vaccinations, antivirals, uh, hospitalizations, so we have hospitals set up to deal with severe cases of influenza um, and by and large we can treat people uh, pretty well. And this is why hospitals have some spare capacity and they fill up in the middle of winter. So those tools we don't have for COVID-19. We have no vaccine and I keep seeing staff we're going to develop a vaccine. Uh, just to let you know the sort of phase one, phase two, phase three trials that you would need to go to to sure it's even going to work at all will take 18 months. Um, antivirals, they could work. Um, we don't know yet and hopefully we'll get some of those developed uh, or repurpose other ones uh, soon. And hospitalisation could work or it seems our latent capacity is fairly low there for the numbers we're expecting. And scaringly, the paper published just yesterday in The Lancet by the Wuhan people from China of 190 odd patients in the hospital there, of which 54 died, uh, showed, well, yeah, a quarter of those people got better who came in that obviously had severe cases. Um, but most worryingly, in intensive care, they ventilated 56 patients, uh, 54 of them went on to die. So it's not like that ventilation was life saving. Only two survived that. So hospitals could help, but not so much um, at that far end. So they produced this. Here's my graphs, folks. Uh, yeah, there we go. So that's their modelling of 
leaving things in the US and the UK to their own ends, to just little mitigation, just to sort of run their course. This was this whole sort of idea of herd uh, immunity that would happen. The trouble with this is that modelling predicts 1.2 million deaths in the US and 250,000 in the UK, and that's probably not acceptable to us. Um, and the question is, can we do better than that? Uh, so the technique we're left with then is one called suppression. So we can't mitigate this because we don't have those tools. What tools do we have? We have tools for depression. So they model various scenarios, and you've seen this. People have seen views of this flat in the curve. So there's the big peak to one side there and doing different strategies like closing schools and universities would flatten it a bit. Uh, isolation would flatten it a bit more. Uh, doing a combination of all those would flatten it a lot. So we're, we're not trying to gather herd immunity. We're just trying to push this down, down, down. And that will give us much more capability in our hospitals to deal with sick people. And most importantly, it will buy us time to develop other things like antivirals that work or vaccines that work. What happens when you unsuppress? Well, this is a possibility, isn't it? That it just comes back again and, and gets everyone because we didn't have any immunity to it. And this is the concern in China right at the moment, isn't it? They've reduced their cases to zero today for the first time. Everyone goes back to work. Uh, there isn't an immunity in that population. There's no herd immunity in the Chinese population to the COVID-19 virus. So it has the potential to come back. Um, and so everyone's going to be watching China with a great deal of interest to see if indeed that happens. So that's our, the best advice at the moment is actually this. And you would heard the, if anyone follows New Zealand news, we've closed our borders to everyone but New Zealanders today. Australia's followed under the same. I think that's timely uh, for suppression. What we're looking at is something like this. And Jacinda Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister, they didn't even describe such a scenario on TV. We want initial suppression, and then we want a series of mini peaks. So we suppress, we unsuppress, we suppress, we unsuppress, and we build up an immunity as a population to this. Some unknowns that we don't know. So we don't know how lethal this is. So how can we don't know that? Well. There's a few things here. We don't know how many asymptomatic people there are. There's one published paper from Italy. They tested all 3,100 people in a village, and 50% of the people that had COVID-19 were asymptomatic. So that could tell us something. We also don't have a test that's sensitive enough yet. And this is the thing. You think you've tested for COVID-19, and you have or haven't got it. The test sensitivity runs at 71%. So in fact, it correctly identifies people who have it 71% of the time. It incorrectly says people don't have it when they do in fact have it 29% of the time. That's an issue uh, which we need to resolve. So back to mortality and lethality of this, the question is how, how come we don't know well, we don't know exactly how many people have it, especially asymptomatic people, so I don't, want to, don't know what the denominator to divide with actually is. That's an issue. There's a question of which denominator you divide by. So if you, even if you knew the denominator, you know, well, there's a 1,000 cases today and 30 people have died, that's a 3% mortality. Actually, what you really need to know is how many cases there were when these people contacted it, which was probably 14 days prior or 10 days or something. So... It's, it's because those things are at different points, and that's an issue. So we don't know. Um, the latest paper in The Lancet published two days ago suggests that COVID-19 has a, an actual lethality rate of 5%. I think that's grossly overestimated. In fact, I think that's actually wrong. I'm surprised it was published. Um, it's probably more like 1%. That still makes it 10 times more deadly than the seasonal influenza and quite dangerous. Uh, and there's also a, a, a difference in lethality across age groups. We hear a lot about our older and most vulnerable. What we know from the Lancet data about 
China is 91% of the people who died or hospitalized had comorbidities. They had other metabolic issues. Most interestingly, hypertension, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease were the major uh, risks for doing poorly. Um, that's obviously also associated with age. Uh, so whether it's age itself or it's the existence of those is something. Uh, it doesn't leave all young people alone. In fact, I have some data on this from the Imperial College group. So you can expect about 1.2% of 20 to 29 year olds to require hospitalization. Uh, and you can expect about 5% of that 1.2% to require intensive care. For my age group, which is 50 to 59, about 5% of us are gonna need hospitalization and about 12% of that 5% are going to need ICU. For the 70 to 79 year olds, about 25% are going to require hospitalization and about 43% of that 25% are going to require ICU. If you're 80 plus, we're thinking it's going to be about 27% are going to require hospitalization and about 70% of those are going to require ICU. So you can see it escalates massively as you get older but it doesn't leave young people alone. So young people who are immunocompromised um, or have other comorbidities are uh, vulnerable as well, and we shouldn't forget that. So going forward, uh, suppression is the only strategy that we have because it's the only tools we have. We have no mitigation strategies, just to be clear. So the only things we can do are to test for what it's worth, to self-isolate, if you feel you've been exposed or have any symptoms at all. They are to social distance, especially from the old and vulnerable. Uh, they are to distance ourselves across society from large gatherings. And I think most governments have seen fit to do all of those. I just think we need to take those seriously, very seriously. They're the only tools we have. Here's my last slide. First of all, this is a long game. So that's a question, how long does this go on for? And uh, four days ago, we might have thought three months was a long time. Two days ago, we thought six months was maybe about right. In the last day or two, this might go on for 18 months. So point two, there's a new normal. Point three, we are resilient. So there is the reality of the world we lived in doesn't exist anymore. It's gonna be different. It may not be better, it may not be worse, it's just different. Uh, we humans are massively resilient and adaptable to this, and we will adapt, and we do, will do well in this. Um, but we're gonna need to support each other, uh, and you out there can do that. So in Precure Land, um, please join us every night in, in suppressing this virus, uh, protecting our most vulnerable, uh, my dad is in his nearly 80s with cancer. Uh, my mum's elderly. My mother and father-in-law are older and um, have risk factors. Um, I'm keen to see more of them, but they are going to be isolated themselves and we need to help look after them and make their life uh, not just bearable, but good. Um, and we need to be mindful of that, how we go forward.